welcome back to 6.5 on the road from Las Vegas covering Dell Technologies World 2024, the AI edition. I'm Lisa Martin with Dave Nicholson. Dave, what's been some of your favorite conversations we've had so far at the AI edition? Dell is in its Swifty AI era. Honestly, my favorite conversation is gonna be the next one we're about to have. <gasps> That wasn't even planned, ladies and gentlemen. We've got two <laughs> guests here willing to give you a fantastic conversation. Brian Doty is here. Welcome, Brian, the Director of Product Management at Dell Technologies, and Phil T, the co-founder and chairman CEO of Moopsoft. Guys, welcome. Uh, great to be here. Well, happy like to have this. you. So, Phil, starting with you, Dell generated a lot of buzz a little less than a year ago with yeah. the acquisition of Moopsoft. We've learned a lot in the last 36 hours from Dell about um, Apex AI Ops portfolio, which includes products like Cloud IQ yeah. and Moogsoft, as well as Dell's new application observability product. Talk to us about what's transpired since that acquisition in, in less than a year's time and what some of the new things are on the horizon for the portfolio. You know, it's been a, a crazy busy uh, nine months, actually, it turns out. And uh, you know what we've been doing is busily uh, pulling together both the, the Moogsoft technology and Cloud IQ into what I think is going to be an incredible uh, AI op suite. And of course, joining the, the, the duo to make a trio uh, is Instana as part of our application observability um, to give us full stack. So we can actually take um, you know, monitoring all the way from the LUN, if you like, the, the, the fundamental storage element, all the way through the application, cross domain, and use AI at every step along the way to give unparalleled insights. I mean, it's super exciting. At Dow, we may be one of the very few companies out there with such a comprehensive um, AI op suite. And this is just the beginning, right? This is our first act. And you know where we're gonna go with this, I think is gonna really knock people's socks off as we build a fully integrated portfolio and take that forward across the whole of um, the operations. It sounds like it's good. It's already knocking people's socks off, I'm sure. Brian, you're a Dell OG from what I understand. 25 years. No. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Really? Yeah. People Did you start when I you were like four? Since you were three? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's up with that? It's a child but, labor was in Texas. Child labor. <laughs> <laughs> but you've had the opportunity to see a tremendous amount of change and evolution of systems management of Dell's products. Talk to us about what you've seen and what the changes and the opportunities mean for Dell's customers, existing and future? Uh, so much, right? Uh, I, I joined Dell in the late 90s. And when I joined Dell, you know, we had just um, made a foray into enterprise, right? Uh, servers were a new thing. I remember still the first generation of, of Dell systems, right? Um, the idea of remote management was non-existent back then. You know, the, the industry hadn't developed uh, the technologies uh, like we have with iDRAC today with our PowerEdge servers in order to, to allow customers to remotely uh, manage systems and not have to walk into the data center. So, so much has changed, right? Um, data center is a hostile environment. I, I don't know if you've ever been in one, but it's not a good place to be. Um, but, you know, take that kind of as a starting point. Now we're talking about um, bringing together all of uh, Dell infrastructure and fleet-based management. We have a product uh, today uh, called Apex AI Ops, previously called Cloud IQ, uh, which has the capability to monitor uh, and report on virtually everything, uh, every Dell uh, enterprise asset under a customer's control. And not only can we monitor and report on that, but we can provide insights to customers. We can tell them why the failures are occurring. We monitor performance of systems so people can understand. And actually, as uh, Phil pointed out, bringing together the uh, Instana uh, application performance monitoring, as well as uh, the capabilities in Moogsoft to get to the bottom of what's causing the issues. But uh, it's, a, it's a stark contrast, what we have today um, and what, what I had when I, when I joined. I can't even imagine. So just to be clear, um, when I was young, data centers were something we called caves. <laughs> and the data was cave paintings on the walls. So yeah, we've been in data centers before. <laughs> but I want to I I dive in a little on this. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to say that AI is infusing all of these things. Um, is a lot of that taking the form of natural language processing in, in, in terms of enabling the operator to, um, to, to, to query the system? So, so you see, you see something go wrong, and instead of having to go through and parse all sorts of logs yourself, the ability to say, has this ever happened before? <laughs> or something maybe, maybe not that simplistic, but is that what you, when you talk about 
AI helpers in that regard? Mm. Or give, me an give me an example of how AI is enhancing this. You know, I can give you a, a bunch of examples. I mean, okay. it turns out there's, there's well over 150 patents in what we announced today. Mm -hmm. So, and we've been at this for quite a while. I mean, we've been applying AI to the uh, IT operations uh, problem uh, for 16 plus years. Now, uh, you know, uh, let me give you two. Um, so the first example is you get a lot of alerts. Uh, you know, you, you, and, and when I say a lot, I mean, I'm talking billions of data points can come into uh, one of our systems. And it's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack of haystacks. Uh, and, and you need to be able to sort of narrow that down. Now, if you try and do that as a human being unassisted, or even write a lot of rules that model the behavior of what you're trying to do, it's extraordinarily difficult to get there. We can use some very clever machine learning technology to understand the patterns that the eye wouldn't see uh, to be able to find that needle in the haystack, and we do it incredibly efficiently uh, inside of the instant management part of the portfolio. That's one example. Another example is, you know, Adele, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's been around even longer than Brian, right? I mean, you have to remember this is a 40-year-old company. And so there is, you know, something in the region of 180,000 written knowledge articles uh, inside of Dell, which describe the everything from, you know, how do I get this, you know, this server to reboot or, you know, how do I extend a, you know, logical partition in a particular um, storage device? You know, it's a wealth of knowledge. And what we can do by using generative AI, of course, the, very much the darling of the moment as a technique, is give people the ability to query that knowledge base without having to be the expert that knew everything in there. So you can be sort of elevated to the level of a, you know, a super god of, of, of infrastructure by asking simple questions like, you know, um, how do I you know, perform this automation or this task? And it will give you the answer back in a, in a concise form. So that's just two examples, but there are many, many, many more. Yeah, and just to, to jump on the back of what Phil was talking about, when we had our first meeting post-acquisition, Phil said something that really struck me, and he says it's about humanizing IT operations, right? And I, and I think about that too, especially with your example of the uh, AI ops assistant or, or Gen AI capability. Um, yeah, there's tens of thousands of, of knowledge base articles. There are, uh, there are dozens of, or hundreds of, of Dell security advisories, right? And yeah. when we publish these, you know, you know, back in the day, I thought, Again, going back to when I joined, you know, publish all these articles, we assume customers read them. Well, they, they don't, right? But if you had an assistant where you could ask a question, um, or even um, as, as what we do today with AI ops, uh, the observability, uh, infrastructure observability capabilities, we curate those articles. You don't have to read 100 or 1,000. Here's the one that you, is relevant to you, right? So bringing the right information to the customers at the right time. So that's why I like the term uh, humanization of, of IT operations. Now, I, I want to pile on your pylon. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course. You know, we, we, heard in, we heard in Jeff Clark's uh, keynote today about the 27 followed by 30 zeros. Yes. Um, amount yes. Of I mean, it is crazy, crazy, crazy how much scale we are talking about this new AI revolution is going to create. And, you know, to manage that, if AI didn't exist, we'd have to invent it because it's gone way beyond the scope that human beings have to be able to comprehend information. You just can't do it. So, you know, you've got to have these techniques or you will just drown in the complexity of the infrastructures that we're deploying today. Are operators, for lack of a better term, going to need to have the same level of computer science background in the future that they have needed in the past? You've heard, maybe you've heard reference to uh, Jensen Wong, NVIDIA yeah. being interviewed, and uh, his counsel to someone going into college is, Maybe you maybe maybe the whole STEM thing doesn't have the allure that it used to. Do you have any thoughts on that? You talk about humanizing um, these operations, hu humanizing IT. Does that mean that the uh, French literature major might actually be better suited for those kinds of things because their mind is working in terms of language, and if we're if we can increasingly communicate with these systems with human language, then a facility with human language becomes more important than the computer side of things. Is there a risk? Do, first, do you see it going in that direction? Second, is there a risk that our, that our computer science muscles atrophy and we become sort of slave to the machine? Yeah. Gosh, that's a really big question. And you know, in- You have in, 30 seconds. I mean, <laughs> it, you know, in, in some regards, what he said was both profoundly stupid and profoundly insightful. Um, so, you know, uh, if we allow uh, our muscles of problem-solving, deep tech expertise, 
you know, at the end of the day, Jeff was on stage wearing a It's Only Math only T-shirt. Math. <laughs> t-shirt. Like, we don't teach our kids the ability to comprehend the underlying, underpinning uh, foundations of this. We're toast because eventually we'll build an antikythera machine so complicated nobody will know how to maintain or, or propagate it. On the other hand, I think maybe where it was coming from. This is, it, this is where we pause and we explain to the audience not familiar with the device found under the sea. The antikythera, exactly. Thank, the, thank, the, yeah. the people, you know, yes. it's, it's a rich source of science fiction. Look, look it up, folks. Yeah, really it's a rich yeah, source sorry, of science I'm fiction. I'm sorry, I digress. Please, please, continue. On, on the other hand, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. On the other hand, you know, maybe the point that he's making is, you know, we all become knowledge workers in the world of Gen AI, right? We, we don't need uh, 20 years of experience in, you know, how to string together, you know, the right incantation to get the computer to do what it is that you want to do. So the what and the why and becomes much more important than the how. So you take language skills. I know of one startup, Alfie.ai, and what they're doing is they are language skill people that are understanding how to look for insensitive language in an email or potentially um, uh, dangerously litigious language in, in an email. And their background, you know, they are language majors. They understand language and they understand DEI. Now, uh, you know, look, I've worked am amongst a lot of really bright engineers, but that is not a skill that I've come across a lot in the lab. So interesting. So we can weaponize that skill in a, if weaponize it yeah, in a positive way. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Any thoughts on the on my rant? Uh, <laughs> no, that's a good question. I mean, I, I don't think it. I, I agree with Phil. It doesn't fundamentally change uh, what the IT professionals are doing. It's just that they're not as as busy in the minutia. In fact, when I talk to IT pros a lot, um, I've worked in systems management virtually my entire career. They want to free themselves up to work on more important things, right? And so, yeah, I don't think it, you know, it certainly changes things. And I don't know, this may be too long of an example, but I have some friends who work in Seattle and they do film. And I remember talking to one of them over lunch, uh, different world entirely, right? That when they, the day they realized their job would have changed forever. And it was when um, a certain electronics manufacturer had created a DLR, a DLR camera that could actually do all the post processing. Mm -hmm. And so, and he was a sound and, and lights person, and his job changed. It completely, it, made, it didn't make his job irrelevant, but all of a sudden now they didn't need these huge, you know, groups of, of folks uh, setting up stages for for uh, film and video, right? So, but you know, he he's still it's a, you know it's, he leverages skills in different aspects of film, right? So I think it's sort of the same inflection point. It's just uh, uh, remaining relevant and in a different way. Don't you think there are some um, kind of almost very profound ethical problems here? I mean, you will have caught recently. Um, Scarlett Johansson uh, getting quite upset about the fact that ChatGPT 4.0 appears to have a voice that sounds uncomfortably like Scarlett Johansson. Mm -hmm. So there is a way of leading your life that may disappear. Maybe AI replaces celebrities, right? I mean, do we, <laughs> do we really need a Scarlett Johansson if you can recreate one using ChatGPT? It'd be a lot cheaper. Uh, it would be. You know, and you could have whatever scandals you want to have uh, to order. Right to keep the uh, the fans enthralled. I, and, I think and that's already happening, actually. Isn't there like a yeah, an there, Instagram star there or something are Instagram like that? Instagram influencers AI. that aren't real. That's right. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. Uh, it is fascinating. Yeah, I guess the answer would uh, would depend upon whether or not you make your living as a celebrity. And uh, <laughs> I think Scarlett Johansson would say, "Ooh, the, it's fascinating that they are actually licensing their personas so that they can be leveraged that way in well, a way." People, but, but yeah. Yeah, people will find ways to monetize, you know, everything. Uh, but I, I, I do think it's kind of an interesting parlor game to play, maybe. You know, wh which uh, professions are going to be most impacted? And, and I sometimes talk about this. I mean, we were just at an AI conference last week and saying there's a lot of the talk track would lead you to believe that this is a kind of a bosses versus the workers thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, AI is going to kind of automate away, uh, you know, the humble, uh, you know, sons of the soil, as it were, or daughters of the soil, you know, writing code in sort of sweatshop factories, you know, in sort of, you know, big software companies like Microsoft or whatever. You know, if AI can drive a car, well, it can run a company, can't it? So, so maybe it's actually the middle and the upper levels. We all get watched over by machines of love and grace, to quote Ayn Rand, uh, you know, and you start working in companies that are run by AI. How about that for a thought? Interesting perspectives. 
Brian, take us out here. What are some of your thoughts on the AI revolution? You, you talked about being at Dell Technologies for a very long time, what you've seen now, just some, even some of the potentials that Phil alluded to. What yeah. excites you about where Dell and its ecosystem is going? Well, it's forcing us to rethink everything, right? So, um, you know, being in product management, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't, I, I do react to what customers want at, in the here and now, and we have to make time for that. But I spend most of my time thinking about, okay, what's next gen, right? What does management look like in five years or 10 years? Because that's the journey we have to start right now. And so that's a, a challenging question. What, you know, it's <clears throat> certainly, uh, Dell has a, a lot of capabilities that use AI in its uh, um, Apex AI Ops suite. But how does a customer interact with that system? Is it still a UI? Right? Do you need a UI anymore in five years? Right? Is, it, is it completely run by an AI and then you know, it provides you uh, custom built on the fly uh, dashboards to, to show you what you need to know, like what, what uh, a human, what actions a human may have to take, right? Uh, but I think it's really interesting is back in, I think it was 2021, we had a, an interesting uh, show and we had several uh, industry pundits on and it was called uh, um, Autonomous Operations. And uh, you know there there was a lot of reactions to that. A lot of it, a lot of folks uh, you know who who were reacting to it. Oh, this is this is impossible. This is science fiction. And I, I you know it's it's only been a few years now where they still think it's science fiction. And so I think what's really exciting is not so much just the insights we can give to customers, but having the machines act on those insights, right? So, you know, taking the full the full action, the complete autonomy. Yeah, I <clears throat> with it with with the little time we have, I, I do want to double click on that because it's interesting. I think that if people understood the autonomous operations that are occurring in their lives every day, <laughs> they wouldn't be so skeptical. Uh, we get used to pushing our foot on an accelerator in a vehicle, whether it's electric or internal combustion, and it goes forward. But everything happening in between is extremely complex and orchestrated, and we just get used to it working all of the time. Um, building out data center infrastructure and sort of the leading edge of IT is, is arguably not necessarily more complex, but it's often more bespoke and it can't be as standardized. But to the extent that we can standardize it, absolutely automation is going to happen. I agree. Yeah, 100%. And you know, I think um, there's a sort of a zooming out uh, feature of this, if you will. So at some degree, all complexity, all variation becomes homogenous. Um, and maybe the, the big thing that um, generative AI and AI in general will give us is the ability to create solutions that are generic for things that underneath the covers are very, very complex. And that could be you know, hugely empowering. Wow, we have to have you guys back because you're. I feel yeah. like we're just scratching the surface yeah, here. Yeah, this is meant to be a three-hour podcast. With the amazing <laughs> conversation. We're sorry, yeah, let me apologize that we, 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 just, we just can't. Phil and Brian, thank you so much for joining us and really just piquing our interest with what's going on, the potential, mm. it's the horizon to me is, is so exciting. Totally. So Likewise. we'll have to have you guys back. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. For our guests and for Dave Nicholson, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching Six Five on the Road covering Dell Technologies World 2024. One more guest joins us and two more guests join us last, so stick around. <laughs>